Good evening, everybody, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to the 17th edition of the Terrestrial University. I'm very excited, not only because we have today wonderful speakers, but also because the topic of today's issue is insects and especially dragonflies. Insects are an immense big class of our non-human cohabitants and still very much overlooked. For many of us, it is still very difficult to have an empathic attitude to them because their corporal and temporal realities are so different from, for example, mammals. But no doubt that uh, they are worth paying attention and that we can even learn so much from them. For example, they can help us to perceive and respond in a more faster way to the climate crisis and environmental threats. As a side note, uh, I would like just to mention that uh, Bruno Latour's latest book, uh, Où suis-je, Where am I? Uh, that was written uh, at the time of the corona lockdown in the form of a philosophical tale, was inspired by Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. Summoned by Latour, the poor Gregor Samsa, uh, who one morning finds himself transformed into a cockroach, becomes the metaphor of our confined status and of general reversal of perspectives. And this metamorphosis calls for another one, uh, for um, actual mutation uh, of ourselves. Since the world has been transformed, it is now our, change, uh, our turn to change, namely to become new terrestrial beings and to change our entire political, technical and uh, economic uh, organization according to the new understanding of our territory as a critical zone that is shaped by uh, cycles that are happening in um, nature and by entanglements. Taking Sibylle Neumeyer's installation Souvenir Entomologique Number no. 1, Odonata Weathering Data, uh, that is now on display, by the way, um, in the uh, exhibition Critical Zones and also on uh, the website of the ZKM on the uh, event page of the Terrestrial University. Uh, we uh, will start uh, the conversation and will attempt to investigate how insects can invite us to reconsider a diversity of relationships between humans and non-humans, and also to understand better our interdependencies inside the critical zone. Um, so the video can be watched online today and uh, till um, approximately midnight. Um, also, the uh, video and the installation by Sibylle uh, was created in collaboration with the uh, State Museum of Natural History in Karlsruhe. Uh, and uh, also, Museums of Natural History will be today uh, one of the topics of uh, the conversation. Because as institutions, they shape very much our understanding and knowledge about nature. We will try to find uh, an answer to the question, what implications the mass extinction and ecological crisis have on their work. And I hope also that we will be able to discuss today how can uh, also older forms of knowledge, for example, old forms of insect human relationships be recollected, how we can embrace and recover a diversity of knowledge as fertile ground for new allies and terrestrial communities. Um, I would like at first to introduce our team behind the scenes. Uh, I'm today uh, with um, um, my colleague from the video studio, Tim Vance and Andy Koch, uh, who are mastering this live stream. Uh, and also Adamantia Golandris, my colleague from the press, is in charge of the Telegram chat. Uh, I would also gladly introduce our interpreters, Sonia Vilna and Leonie Wagner. And I'm glad to express deep gratitude to the baden Dolmetschen for our cooperation. And now I'm very, very pleased to welcome Sibylle today, together with uh, Dr. Jessica Ware and Professor Dr. Michael John Gorman. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're very much looking forward to uh, the discussion and uh, your input. And uh, I will also like uh, quickly um, uh, introduce uh, you before we start into the conversation. So Jessica Ware is uh, speaking to us today from New Jersey. <laughs> She's curator of invertebrate zoology at the American Museum of Natural History and is a researcher of behavioral and psych uh, psychological adaptations in dragonflies, cockroaches, and termites. Besides chairing the Worldwide Dragonfly Association and the Entomological Society of America, 
She engages in supporting people of color communities and diversity in science and in research. Uh, dear Michael John, you are founding uh, director of Biotopia, Naturkunde Museum Bayern, and professor of life sciences in society at uh, the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Building upon your expertise in science, technology, and society, you are the founder of the Science Gallery in Dublin and International, and creating spaces for dialogues between art, design, science, and the audience. You also published Idea Kaleidos, the future of science museums in 2020 with the MIT Press. And now, <laughs> dear Sibylle, you're an interdependent artist and researcher. Your projects are based on collaborations and dialogues with a diversity of knowledge holders and focus on modern human relations, nature, cultures, and ecological issues. Currently, you are an artist fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam researching on transformative narrative as well as member of collection ecologies and multidisciplinary research collective on museum collections. So uh, now I also would like to draw your attention that uh, we are accompanied by the Telegram group today as always in the Terrestrial University. So you are very welcome to write comments and uh, your questions via ZKM underscore critical zones. It's our Telegram group. And uh, we will try to bring your questions into the conversation. And now, Sibylle, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Please uh, jump into the presentation. Give me one second to share my screen. Um, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for all being here today uh, in the audience, but also uh, as discussion participants. And thank you, Daria, for the kind introduction and the even kinder invitation for this discussion round um, and also to contribute to the exhibition, um, which enabled me to initiate this ongoing research on the intersection of meteorology and biology on environmental data and collaborative sensing practices um, with, with my goal to, to recollect alternate ways of being in dialogue with the world. Um, Weathering Data is a video essay installed in a landscape of insect traps, and it is exhibited together with the specimens from the State Museum for Natural History in Karlsruhe SMNK. And these specimens, um, as you can't see them in the video today, were arranged according to different forms of how we look at and relate to dragonflies and other insects. Um, for example, as a freshwater observatory or as a pollution indicator, um, as climate canaries, as threatened life forms, but as well as ambassadors for cultural diversity or local ecological knowledges. So today I want to share some of the research that the work is based on um, and with the question of the role of insects in the global climate and extinction crisis, I started my research by visiting um, insect collections at the SMNK in Karlsruhe and the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. And I was choked by the amount of specimens that are holding drawers and the rooms full of cupboards. Um, so the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, for example, holds currently 15 million insect specimens. Um, the SMNK, the State Museum for Natural History in Karlsruhe, holds about 3 million insects stored in about 20,000 drawers. So that was a huge number and um, all or at least most of them are alphabetically ordered um, in a nice grid of cupboards um, and they contain classes and families. Um, so I was asking myself, how are these collections relevant for today's research and in this crisis? Um, I started speaking with curators and I learned not only about the practices of storing and collecting specimen, but also, um, yeah, their practices, cataloging and digitization of the insects and the taxonomic work they are doing 
um, but also about the current tasks of biodiversity research, ecosystem conservation measures, and also facilitating citizen science. So while the task in the, of the collections in the 19th and 20th century was to discover and classify new species, um, today natural sciences have the emphasis not only on biodiversity research, but also on ecosystem conservation and also the prevention of extinction. And researchers as well as citizen scientists go into fields and they list um, occurrences and abundances of butterflies, of moth, of dragonflies, of bugs, and a diversity of wild bees and other pollinators. So I soon understood how this work of the researchers is connected with forms of mapping and monitoring. So a big part of this mapping and monitoring process is then also the storage of records of observations as well the digitization of the existing collections in uh, so-called databases. And together with the social anthropologist Tahani Nadim from the Museum für Naturkunde, I looked closer at the digital catalogs of the collections. Um, and these occurrences um, of insects, the observations, um, they are all um, yeah, fed into these data portals, like for example, the GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And here they actually meet with their potential ancestors um, as they are listed together with the digitized specimens of the museum collections. Um, so these lists um, contain information on the class, of the family, the species, the date and site of site or collection event. And of course, the name of the collector. And these uh, databases are, are, in, um, are designed um, to make glo global data accessible and also to enable researchers to search for specific specimens from abroad. So that is also, I think, a big part of the, the work that Jessica is doing. So this, yeah, this form of digitization um, started in 2005. Um, and they are also um, yeah, producing uh, images and, and meanwhile also 3D models of the insects um, for research purposes. So not only the information about the occurrence, but also yeah, like visual information about the species can be sent uh, through the networks. Um, yeah, and the, the devices that are used for that are constantly co-evolving um, with the, yeah, with the possibilities with new technologies, but also um, interestingly in response to the characteristics of the insects. So, because they are so intensely diverse, um, yeah, it's very difficult to, to use the same setting to photograph uh, different, different species um, because their size, their volume, their texture and colors, they all challenge, challenge the lenses. Um, and as well the photographers. Um, so here see, you see some devices that are involved in the digitization of insects within natural history museums. So for example, a scanner there that is um, able to scan the whole insect jars and it's using um, uh, Inselect, which is a software that teaches algorithms um, to tag directly the specimen in the jars. Um, and this is super interesting because um, yeah, this enables automatic mass digitizations and speeds up the workflow. Um, and on the right side, you see the disk 3D scanner that is taking 420 pictures of one insect um, from, from all sides and then creates this realistic 3D models. Um, yeah, so like many other museums worldwide, um, the, the goal of the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin is also to digitize the whole insect collection. I mean, that is a really big task and it's a big swarm of data that is, is going in the web. Um, yeah, the goal of, of the museum in Berlin is 15 million specimens um, to be digitized in the next 10 years. 
But interestingly, it's not only the dead insects that are encountering new technologies. So while dragonflies and other species are more and more acknowledged as sensing beings, the spiral indicators, um, which means they are sentinels or indicators for pollution, for warming, but also for the well-being of an ecosystem. Um, yeah, in, in this new role, um, insects become kind of media themselves that can communicate and translate changes in our environment um, so that these changes become perceptible for us. Um, but insects are quite mobile and their migratory patterns and range expansions, um, also their decrease in abundance are are difficult to observe, so they are tracked and monitored increasingly with the help of as well technological devices such as um, as microsensors. Um, so, for example, on the left side, you see um, what the research team around Martin Wikelski does uh, from the University in Constance. So they use sensors to track the dragonfly migrations. Um, the project is called ICARUS, uh, the International Cooperation of Animal Research Using Space, uh, which means they use money, they use sensors to monitor the wildlife with the help of satellites from space. And thanks to Michael Gorman, I'm also now aware of a, a more extreme form of applying technology to insects which you see on the right, that is the Dragonfly project um, by Draper Laboratory. Um, and I thought this is super interesting. So really thank you for bringing that in, in our conversations. Um, it, uh, I quote now from the website, it consists of a living slightly modified Dragonfly that carries a small backpack of electronics. The backpack interface is directly with the Dragonfly's nervous system to control it and uses tiny solar panels to harvest enough energy to power itself without the need for batteries, end quote. So while such a project blurs, of course, the borders between what is animal and media, um, yeah, it also recalls modes of military surveillance and um, yeah, manipulation of nature. So, so we could also ask, what are the ethical limits of, of our technological implications. And the space is crowded um, with satellites that serve different applications of tracking, monitoring, scanning and imaging. And these should help us to, to monitor disasters or weather changes. Um, I'm actually having a guest fly today, if you can see it. Um, sea and surface temperatures, um, but as well agricultural areas and, and conflict zones. Um, yeah, so, so same as the satellites, also um, ground-based radar technology derives from, from military times. Um, radar, that is the radio detection and ranging technology was um, initially developed during World War II and it was there to spot the enemy ships and, and planes. Um, and interestingly, initially the echoes from hail, sleet, snow or rain, um, they were also called hydrometeors. They were regarded as unwanted and disturbing signals. Um, and I thought that is, that is quite interesting. Of course, this variety of incoming signals invited after the war for new applications. And now it is used to detect um, preci precipitations and, and rainfall and weather. So the, the technology itself underwent the metamorphosis according to what it was able to do, but um, yeah, providing a different um, yeah, application um, purpose. Mm. So, but still sometimes in these radars, uh, for weather detection, there are disturbances um, occurring on the screen. And on the in image on the right, you can see how swarms of insects uh, throw reflections to the radar signals appearing as clouds. So these are um, yeah, a massive wave of butterflies uh, over Denver. And for a long time, such disturbances um, were called dot angels. 
and they were sorted out by the meteorologists. And it's only recently that radar found attention as a device for monitoring also aero ecologies, so like the, the biological activities in the sky. And again, um, unwanted signals are the center of attention. Um, Chris Hadel, which I'm also in contact with, um, and his research team of Biodar in Leeds, um, they develop new methods to implement radar um, in order to, to find out why the global insect populations are collapsing. And also um, they try to provide early advanced warnings um, of pest swarms that could threaten the crops in agricultural fields. Um, so in order have, to have efficient research insights um, from these uh, devices, um, it's also interesting that these reflections are made readable um, with the help of artificial intelligence, um, which is trained in shape detection. And this training is done with 3D models that also come from the scanned specimens of, of natural history collections. But not only the, the human technology and devices are able to read the environment, but the much older form of sensors um, are also the insects themselves. Um, they are highly sensitive organisms. They're equipped with hyperreceptors and antennae, um, dragonflies, for example. They change their behavior according to the weather. They are more active when it's sunny. They rest when it gets cold or too hot. And also the climatic conditions and seasonal shifts impact their life cycles. So hatching and breeding times or for some species, the migration timing. Um, so recently Western research is drawing more attention to that sensorial spectrum of insects and their weather related behavior um, as climate warming is impacting their survival and thus um, also the ecological networks. This, uh, yeah, it was really interesting for me to look deeper into this um, ability of insects to read the weather. And um, it's actually not new knowledge, um, but it's acknowledged for millennia in local, ecolog local ecologic knowledge forms. So rural um, communities in India, in Africa, in Asia, um, they make decisions on planting, on harvesting, and seeding according to the signs from their direct environment um, for predicting rainfalls and droughts and weather and season changes. So while in most of our countries, weather and seasonal climate forecasts are available through uh, meteorological services, um, especially in the remote areas, um, the access to information from modern weather station is really limited for communities. And this image here shows, for example, the multi-species collaborators of the Shona tribes in Southern Africa. And they listen to the songs of crickets. They observe the flight direction of bees, examine the activities of spiders and the flight of dragonflies to forecast weather. Um, and dragonflies in many cultures in India and Africa serve as rain indicator. Um, but most of this indigenous knowledge is um, together with the vernacular names, not acknowledged by Western sciences and even erased also by practices of classification um, in biological sciences. These rural um, communities in Asia, in Africa and India also are unfortunately the most vulnerable groups of climate change induced weather events, um, extreme weather events. And we've just recently here in Germany also experienced um, floods and, and heavy rainfalls, um, but in the so-called global south, they are reoccurring disasters since, since many decades. Um, so local knowledge that, that might help to react earlier to sudden weather events and that, that helps make decision and provide solutions um, in agricultural practices um, that, that is disappearing or it also has been erased with the introduction of plantation systems and of Western crop management. 
in the past, but also uh, yeah, in ongoing colonial power structures. And this is really a big problem for the communities because they are exposed the most and they um, yeah, were the most flexible and um, able to adapt um, yeah, to changes, uh, living already in harsh environments. But now, now the increasing weather patterns really disturb uh, their practices. And of course, such forms of traditional forecast have um, yeah, limitations, but same like the technological weather forecast. Um, and this, especially with the increasing intensities of, of extreme events. So actually, uh, new allies are formed new technological platforms are developed to bring different knowledge forms together. Um, so for example, on the, on the left, you see the trout warning app called Itiki, Itiki um, which is developed by Dr. Mutoni Masinde. Um, and this is a mobile phone-based application that integrates indigenous knowledge and scientific, scientific um, climate decision support for Africa small scale farmers. So um, people can update information of their, inform of their obs observations, um, such as like the side of the dragonfly or um, seeing a specific bird or, or um, yeah, encountering um, different noises. And then they can also access meteorological information and like this, these forms of knowledge are, are brought together and uh, supporting each other to create more reliable forms of forecast. Um, so this, this is providing a tool for both, like for collective and multi-species um, observation and early warning. So, so what I wanted to address with this input is that we observe, we examine and we monitor insects um, through lenses through magnifying glasses, through scanners, X-rays, radars, satellites. Um, and my journey with the dragonflies allowed me to consider the potential and limits of technologically mediated nature, and also to reflect um, forms of perceiving the world without technology. Um, so going linguistically back in time to pre-modern or pre-technological times, Actually, the, the original sense of observation um, as derived from Latin etymology does not mean to gather information and data and does not mean to, to control, but, but to take care. So as we are increasingly relying more and more on media and technology to, re to relate to non-humans and our surroundings, how can we still be open and invite multiple voices into all our networks um, non-human voices, more than human voices, and voices of other knowledge holders. How can we bring in a data-driven world different forms of knowledge together? How can we include non-human perspectives in our ways to relate to the world? And how can increased awareness of entanglements in more than human worlds provide narratives that help us to reorientate towards a multi-species terrestrial community? So before we start our discussion, I want shortly to acknowledge um, as listed here the many experts and scientists and researchers that shared the knowledge, insights and time with me. Um, I also want to mention writers and thinkers that inspire my ever evolving fascination with insects, such as the anthropologist Hugh Graffles and the French entomologist Jean-Henri Fabre, and as well media theorist Yussi Parika, um, just to name a few. I also want to thank Nathan Grave, <clears throat> who composed the soundscape of the video as a hybrid of biophonic and technophonic fragments from our field recordings and from our archival sounds. And last but not least, the institutions that supported the project and which is the ZKM for commissioning and exhibiting the work, the SMNK um, for the accessibility of collections and landing the specimen that I exhibited, um, as well the Department Humanities of Nature at the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin for hosting me as a guest researcher and for inspirational discussions, and the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies for supporting my ongoing research 
and transformative narratives of more than human ecologies. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sibylle, so much. Um, thank you, Sibylle, so much for sharing this uh, very interesting uh, insight into the research because uh, I uh, we have seen the the video but uh, it's really super interesting to know the connections and uh, to see what uh, was your also inspiration and also of course this way of insects uh, from living beings to uh, specimen in the museums to uh, objects of uh, digit digitization and also to uh, cyborgs uh, even and uh, to bioindicators is really uh, fascinating and uh, shows also also the whole scope uh, of, uh, yeah, of how humans uh, uh, treat also the, uh, the insects. Um, but I have a, a very basic question to you also in uh, concern to uh, the title of uh, your work and also why uh, did you uh, focus on dragonflies? Because there are so many uh, insects in the world, there is, there is such immense uh, diversity in this species. Why uh, did you focus on dragonflies? This is a great question, two great questions. Uh, first, uh, the title, um, actually, um, Souvenir Entomologique uh, comes as a, as a homage to Jean-Henri Farbe, who I just mentioned also, um, who was an entomologist in the end of the 19th century. And his, um, yeah, his writing were, were super poetic and super rich, um, but also um, still very different to the objectifying uh, point of view on, on insects. Of course, from today's perspective, um, he anthropomorphed um, the insects a bit too much and, and you know, put human narratives uh, upon them, but still he had the ability to observe them with a lot of patience and to yeah, to describe them and their behavior um, with, with so many details um, and gave them space for their own world making. And I think that is super interesting about him that, you know, he acknowledged that insects make their own worlds. Um, and weathering data, um, the, the uh, yeah, accompanying title is, is related to weathering as a, you know, form of resistance, um, but also weathering as, um, yeah, as, as being exposed to weather. So, so I wanted to, to show that being exposed to the weather also is, um, can be a form of resistance because then you, you address the, the, the crisis directly. Um, yeah, and dragonflies, uh, actually, I think they found me um, because I was in these uh, insects collections uh, totally lost. And they were like, I mean, uh, every insect is amazing. All of them have their own stories. Um, all of them are uh, so special and have so many, yeah, extraordinary characteristics um but then yeah i was i was fascinated by this insect that is neither um regarded as useful or as a pest so it it was you know like kind of a, a side player on this human insect relationship it has no direct um, ecosystem service for us still uh, it eats uh, mosquito larvae so that is quite good it also eats the mosquito adults um but, but yeah, it was always a bit alien for me and, and it, it looks stunning and this is uh, one of the oldest life forms. I mean, all insects are uh, very old, uh, much older than humans I mean, on a time scale. Um, we are nothing uh, in, in comparison to that. Um, but, but yeah, then when I started researching about bioindicators and um, weather indicators, they, 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 they were always there. They, they were constantly around so it was like uh yeah easy for me to make a decision to follow them and to find more about them um yeah and i i think it's not the end of the journey yet yeah great <laughs> thank you so much and um yeah probably jessica could uh, uh also give us a little insight into the diversity of the species and what fascinates her about the dragonflies because you uh, know we have heard an uh, answer from the artist and it would be really super interesting to also hear uh from a scientist what is so fascinating about the dragonflies i mean i'm always kind of amazed um at how much variation there is in the order odonata which is what includes dragonflies and damselflies there's 6500 species globally 
Um, even in very urban areas like New York, New Jersey, we have close to 200 species. Um, so I, they basically have radiated um, and they exist from north of the Arctic Circle all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. They're in arid environments. I've collected them in, in arid Namibia. They're in um, hot rainforests. They're in temperate environments. So they really have kind of expanded and spread across the globe. The migratory dragonflies that Sibyl mentioned um, are well known for long distance travels, but there are others that travel you know, a mere 11 meters their entire life. So there's a lot of heterogeneity, um, some only in flowing water, some only in kind of lentic or still water. Um, their coloration is remarkable uh, and varied. Uh, they are voracious predators, both as nymphs and as adults, as Sibyl mentioned. Um, all of these things, I think, make them very interesting. If you add to that, also, you know, if you add to that the timepiece that this is probably the first thing to fly before birds, before bats, before pterosaurs, it was an insect, and it probably was something that was an ancestor to dragonflies. Then I think that really hooks hooks anyone into wanting to study them. Uh, so I can understand why Sibyl was, was hooked with them because that's the same reason that I was, I was kind of fascinated by them and have decided to devote my life to studying them. Can I, can I ask you uh, following on that? Because I mean, like, yeah, I mean, they are so fascinating and also, you know, this radical transformation they embody. But I, like from your perspective, I mean, why is it so important to study them right now, um, like in, in climate crisis? And yeah, as a bioindicator, for example. Well, I mean, one thing that's really striking about dragonflies and damselflies in general is that they're very vagile. They, they move. Um, so they move in response to weather, as you mentioned, um, and they're kind of constantly expanding and contracting their geographic ranges. So if the habitat in a particular environment is poor, um, then they will leave. And if a habitat gets good, uh, you know, becomes more favorable in another environment, they will go there. So what we're seeing already just in response to climate change is kind of rapid shifts in terms of latitudinal gradient of where we find dragonflies. Um, and some of my colleagues call them climate canaries for this very reason. Um, we have examples of, um, of a dragonfly uh, that used to only be found in, you know, southern um, Spain, Northern Africa, that's now well-established in Sweden, for example. So there are dragonflies that are, have already started to shift northward um, as the climate has, has become more favorable. We're seeing in our work in the Arctic that some species that we find normally in the Arctic in particular locations have been replaced by taxa that we would normally find a bit further south. So they're really good kind of sentinels. They're really good kind of indicators, as you mentioned, to, um, To, to say something is happening, there's change happening. These habitats are becoming more favorable for a variety of reasons or less favorable. And dragonflies very, very quickly respond to that um, much more quickly than, than some other animals. Um, so that's why they would be a really useful tool, I think, in the, in the conversation about, about climate change. Yeah. Um... And probably uh, we can also ask uh, Michael, John, um, because we have uh, now uh, spoke about uh, the uh, insects as bioindicators and uh, like uh, also probably there is something that is uh, so uh, also human in this, like uh, a bit objectifying uh, the, the uh, animals and life forms. Like what do you think as a founder of a museum uh, for uh, natural history, uh, what do you think is uh, really um, yeah, important today to, to create in the museum? What kind of experience so that probably we, um, we, we don't have uh, this uh, objectifying gaze? What is uh, really important to create a bit uh, also empathy probably for, for uh, this kind of species? Yeah, thank you, Daria. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be part of this conversation. And uh, thank you for hosting this and uh, also to Sibyl for her wonderful work, uh, which I hope everyone has had a chance to, to see. And uh, if not, I think it's really uh, worthwhile to, to actually look at the, the video of Souvenir Entomologique. Um, uh, and it's, a I think, a fascinating piece of work that delves into ways of knowing the natural world uh, in very interesting ways and kind of contrast this very data-driven approach of contemporary science uh, playfully with uh, 
a more literary approach, even even taking its title from from um, Fabre's uh, wonderful literary creations. And uh, I I think uh, you know it was said earlier uh, that Fab uh, helped create empathy for, or well, that he he created these rather anthropomorphic visions of insects with. Uh, uh, for example, many people know the story, The Sacred Beetle, about the dung beetles, which was uh, just a wonderful depiction of the struggle between different insects over a ball of dung. Uh, and it really plays out like this epic conflict. Uh, and I, I think uh, now we tend to criticize anthropomorphism in, in, in science and say that that's a very dangerous uh, way to go. Uh, but in, sometimes by doing that, we've lost that empathy. Uh, we, we've lost, we've created distance between people and uh, uh, very complex systems of knowledge. And I think uh, works like Sibyls can help us uh, discover that. And, and, uh, um, and I think we're also living in a very difficult and important time from this point of view. And, and that's why this kind of discussion is urgent. Um, so th this week, even, we, we, there's been a lot of discussion about billionaires going into space. Uh, and uh, this has been the sort of topic du jour. Uh, and and while, while the earth is literally burning, uh, I, I read yesterday that right now the air quality in New York City uh, and probably also in New Jersey where Jessica is, is the worst it's been in 15 years. And the reason for that is the wildfires blazing in the West, in the American West. Um, undoubtedly uh, uh, more frequent and more harsh due to climate change. And right here, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, in Germany, we have experienced huge, terrible floods uh, in, in the last week. So while the earth literally burns, uh, we have the billionaires going to space in the rockets. And this is why I think it's absolutely urgent that we connect people to, to nature in a new way. Um, and uh, just uh, this is one of the things that's driving us in creating Biotopia in Munich. And uh, maybe just to uh, very quickly give you a, a picture from uh, where I was three weeks ago. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, let me see. Uh, so this, this is a wetland and uh, wetlands are, are of course the beloved habitat of many dragonflies. Um, we weren't actually looking for dragonflies, we were looking for amphibians on this occasion. But I think th this brings uh, uh, us to one of the, the, the key topics, uh, I think, uh, of people working in the biodiversity field at the moment, such as Jessica and, uh, and her colleagues in, in different natural history museums around the world. Um, we have a, a huge number of wetlands disappearing from the Earth's surface. So I believe about 35% of wetlands disappeared uh, between 1970 and 2015 around the world. But these are really, really rich habitats uh, for wildlife. So 40% of the world's wildlife live in wetlands. Um, and you can actually see that we were actually looking for amphibians. We discovered these uh, green uh, European green toad, a beautiful creature, which is actually quite rare in Germany. Uh, also tree frogs, uh, the European, the Laubfrosch as it's called, and uh, some snakes, the ringelnatter, and then of course uh, the, the common European toad, for example. So, so uh, this was an inc incredibly rich biotope, but the interesting thing was that we were not in some beautiful wilderness, we were actually in the middle of a city. Uh, and this was in the middle of Munich, and it wasn't um, a, a traditionally wild place. This was a place which was previously owned by the railway. And when the railway built a new railway station, they had to give back a place to nature. So this ha has been a, a place which was damaged by human activity, but over 30 years has become this paradise uh, for, for wildlife and for urban wildlife. And I, I think this is one of the key themes for us right now is the, you know, the place uh, for nature is not necessarily in the pristine wilderness. The place for nature is increasing in the city. And uh, I, the majority of the Earth's population live in cities. Uh, cities um, are, have been historically uh, not the focus of a lot of work in, in natural history and biodiversity research, but that's changing. And I, I think that um, really the future of nature is in our cities. And, and cities are also places of incredible 
uh, evolutionary changes. We have um, people like Menno Schildhausen uh, writing about the London underground mosquitoes. So there are three different species of mosquitoes living on three different lines of the London underground. It's quite extraordinary. So cities can separate species, but they can also collide species. Uh, and I think uh, it's very interesting that we're living in this moment, which you could call the urban Anthropocene. And, and so in thinking about uh, our museums about nature for the future, uh, we need to engage uh, with what's going on in cities and also um, think about um, this phenomenon. Uh, Annette Singh talks about it in her wonderful book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, uh, on life, uh, uh, the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. Uh, that some species actually thrive where humans have uh, human activity has damaged landscapes, including this Matsutake mushroom that she focuses on. Uh, but that's also um, it seems to be true for some of the, the types of uh, amphibians that you see here. So perhaps the, you know we we can have an optimistic vision of the future uh, in. Uh, in places that have experienced damage by humans, of course, there's no more powerful example of this than Chernobyl, um, where, you know, after 30, 40 years, uh, one can see that uh, nature begins to thrive and take over. Uh, so I think these are the kinds of themes that as natural history museums, we have a great chance to engage with. And Jessica was talking and of course is working on one of the greatest natural history museums in the world, uh, was talking about things like also citizen science projects and, and how uh, there are opportunities now for, for science not just to be the purvey of the few uh, curators who have the privilege to work with the, directly with the collections, but can actually be opened up and we can actually benefit enormously from public input into science. So I think there's a great chance to open up the idea of a natural history museum to more participants. And the great thing is that the topics natural history museums deal with have never been more relevant or more urgent than they are today. So I think this is a, a really interesting moment where around the world natural history museums are redefining themselves. And that's also what we're doing here in Munich. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, I think, also a great example also of reconnecting uh, with the ecosystem, like not separating, uh, according to taxonomists, the separation of species, not uh, like organizing them in uh, drawers, uh, putting them in uh, classification, but really reconnecting with also burning issues of uh, today and uh, with also uh, bringing people also to, to this hands-on question, so to speak. Well, yeah. I, th I think it's very important if one has the hands-on and the, the access for the public. I mean, what's really valuable that natural history museums can provide is, of course, the act access to scientists like Jessica who have the expert knowledge. And if one can actually create that platform where the, the public and the scientists can come together and share knowledge, that then it, then it really becomes exciting. Really a time to make the walls of a museum permeable you know, so that the knowledge is really flowing in and out um, in both directions, I think. Fully agree. And I, I, I think, the, I think the, the pandemic has also taught us a lot about uh, how we have to think outside of our big walled institutions, uh, because, you know, suddenly all of these institutions were closed for, you know, in, in some cases over a year. And uh, you know this was obviously a, a terrible uh, experience, uh, but it, but it was also in some ways a catalyst to thinking beyond the walls and opening up to new kinds of public participation without people actually having to make a journey to go into your large museum building. Yeah, fully yeah. agree. I really think that it's so interesting to think about these contact zones and also as you call it colliding, you know, because as you as you mentioned in this ecosystem that has been building up the last 30 years, there is um, snakes and frogs and, and, and you know, not, not everyone likes the snakes. And, and I think with encountering them and learning how they live and also suddenly realizing that there are also dragonflies and um, who eats whom and, and you know how things are connected maybe this this fear of, of alien species and, and, and others also um, yeah minimizes and, and can minimize because you know you, you can you can learn and you can be fascinated with with also like um, sharing your knowledge and creating communities of knowledge sharing um, as uh, Jessica also um, yeah pointed out f from her work at the museum and yeah I think this is so super interesting because there's an urgency to relearn this, this contact zones and this closeness is also maybe 
encounters that are not in the in the first instance very pleasurable but also acknowledging that every every species every being has a place in the world and and maybe trying to to see and and learn this and with these arts of noticing also you know like open the eyes and the senses um and i, I was wondering um jessica because you also um research termites and cockroaches and i mean like um, yeah, when we think about insects, there's always this cultural preference for beautiful and useful and, and uh, the disgust for the less attractive species. So, so I was wondering, um, what is your idea to, you know, like, um, yeah, to study these and, and, and why is it so important? And um, yeah, is, is there a notion of equity in, in your research also, uh, when we think about um, looking at all species and all insects in the, in the same way with the same attention and care. It's an interesting question, Sibyl, because really people do tend to have a very negative visceral reaction when they think about um, cockroaches. Termites are considered now just to be social cockroaches. So we could say cockroaches to apply to both of them. And people feel like they have a, a sense of what a cockroach or a termite is because they know the 2% or so that are pests. But the other mass majority of this order of Vladodia are not pests. So um, it can be a bit of a hard sell to try and, you know, encourage people to, to, be, to, to be enthusiastic or to help participate in your research if you work on those, those groups. Um, but what I think is a good way to kind of encourage people to think about the non-pest species is really just to kind of show that amazing, there is beauty among these, these insects as well. There are cockroaches that are yellow and pink. There are cockroaches that are blue and, and yellow. There are cockroaches that actually have, you know, semi-live young. There are cockroaches that produce milk. They have their spiracles modified into teats and their juveniles actually suckle um, the way that a mammal would. There, when you tell, I think the public or the, or the people who aren't maybe experts in, in cockroach study, if you talk to them about those aspects, the empathy, I think, um, kind of does come in a bit more because people do like things that are inherently beautiful. If you show them that there are some beautiful members of you know, the several thousand species that are in Bladodia, that kind of gets them a little bit curious. If you point out some of the things that they do, some of the mimic um, ants, some of them, like I mentioned, produce milk. If you show them some of these other aspects of their life history, of their natural history, um, I think that can really bring people in. We've gotten so distant. I think we've gone so far away from really encouraging the study of natural history that the majority of people, I think, don't actually know any fun facts about any insects. You know, uh, they might know something about bees pollinating. They might know something about butterflies pollinating, maybe. But to ask someone, do you know anything about cockroaches? The only thing that people usually know is something about their pest status and really nothing about their life history strategies, their interesting mating behaviors, or the things that kind of, I think, that are, are, are more of a hook to, to encourage people to study them. So um, when we want to talk about conservation, we want to talk about, you know, saving or, or conserving species that are cockroaches or termites also, it's important to really underscore the reason why they're very important to save is because saving species is, is inherently important, but also they're probably not gonna eat your home. They're probably not gonna encounter humans at all because they live largely outside of the human condition and they do this service for us by decomposing. You know, most cockroaches and termites are active decomposers and termites, thanks to them, um, you know, they, they digest this, really abundant macromolecule cellulose that many things can't digest. If, if it wasn't for them, we'd be tripping over every tree that's ever fallen down every time we walked outside the door, but we don't. So thank you to termites. So to really encourage people to start thinking about um, the aspects of their natural history that are fascinating, that are beautiful, that do sometimes, you could, I guess you could say that's a service to humans, um, their decomposition. Those are ways to try and get people um, to be more enthusiastic, I think, to build. If I, if I can just jump in there, I mean, uh, that's really interesting that you say that and uh, um, that's, uh, that approach is very much what we are taking in creating Biotopia in Munich, uh, um, because rather than organize the new museum according to the uh, categories like uh, taxonomic categories or, or uh, geographical categories, we're organizing everything around behaviors that connect humans and other species, uh, so that the human is very much part of 
seduce and reproduce our uh, building and shaping. So looking at termites, for example, and how they uh, create, you know, thermal conditions in, in uh, their nests uh, and, um, you know, eating and drinking. And, and so retaking these as themes, but always, always uh, showing the connection with the human. Uh, so exploring all of the weird and wonderful uh, behaviors and processes and activities of these uh, other uh, forms of life, but then also uh, always trying to have that moment of self-reflection where people uh, think about, um, you know, how what we're eating shapes the planet uh, as well as how other different species eat. So uh, it's a very, very similar idea, really. And, um, you know, go, uh, making that a way to connect with, with the audience and, and for everybody to actually see immediately an interspecies connection and to, you know, form a, e even, uh, you know, uh, even through exploring the really strange and diverse ways that, you know, defense happens uh, across species, for example, um, but but always, uh, you know, finding something relevant to themselves in, in what they're seeing. Um, so I, I think that, you know, in the old days, in, in the 19th century, the natural history museums, the, the, you know, Western humans were really the observer. They were outside of the museum. Of course, there were many non-Western humans who were all, often treated uh, appallingly as uh, as specimens or as exhibits. Um, but now, in a way, we need to find ourselves again in the museum as 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 part of as part of nature rather than as something outside of nature. Um, and I, I think I, I'm I'm sure many of us are on that that same journey around the world uh, in in rethinking how we do exhibits and to uh, uh, get people to ask questions about themselves uh, as part of the experience yeah i think it's so great that uh, the concept also is uh, revolving around similarities and not separation and not uh, differences i think it's uh, like really um also very important uh, for today also to uh, change the gaze to change the perspective uh, and to understand that we are part of uh, this also if we speak in terms of uh, Prima Latour of the critical zone and um, of uh, the processes that are taking uh, place there uh, of um, connections and uh, that also our actions of course have a feedback uh, on the uh, or provoke feedback from uh, the planetary system. And uh, I don't know a lot about dragonflies, but I know that they need uh, fresh water to uh, survive. And this is also probably one connection that of course uh, uh, leads us also to humans because we also need uh, fresh water. And probably Jessica could share some examples of threatened uh, uh, dragonflies or like of her research also of um, uh, species um, um, or like of um, yeah, dragonflies that are th uh, threatened already by the climate crisis and by the lack of uh, fresh water. Sure, I can go ahead and start trying to share some screen, my screen here to show just a couple of slides um, that I had prepared. So indeed, you know, so dragonflies and damselflies, they really do rely on fresh water because females and, and males will mate and females will lay her eggs in fresh water and they have a juvenile stage that's completely aquatic and it develops in fresh water. Um, and these nymphs go through a series of, of growth stages um, until they emerge as an adult. So without fresh water, they really can't survive. Um, salt water is largely death to them. And this fresh water can exist as a river going through a bit of desert, but it also, like I mentioned, can exist north of the Arctic Circle. And we've done some work looking at dragonflies that are particularly threatened that are north of the Arctic Circle. People tend to think of dragonflies and damselflies as being tropical. You know, you tend to thinking of them are, are kind of around the equator, um, but actually there's 48 or so uh, that are found north of 66 degrees latitude. Um, and there are, the ones that are shown on the screen here are actually kind of circumpolar. So they actually exist kind of continuously, Russia, Fennoscandia, Alaska, um, and Canada. And so with my postdoc, Manpreet Kohli, we've been working on a particular dragonfly, Somatochlora salbergi, um, which is thought to be exclusively in remote Arctic locations, but it really is threatened by the impacts of climate change because these dragonflies tend to inhabit water, fresh water, that are lakes that have basically no bottom. The bottom of the lake is actually permafrost. And permafrost has like an active layer and then a permanently frozen layer. But unfortunately, uh, because of climate change, um, the active layer, which kind of constantly freezes and, and thaws multiple times, 
that um, is becoming larger and that permanently frozen layer is often in some cases disappearing. Um, as an aside, this also releases a ton of stored carbon um, into the atmosphere, which further is like a, it's a feedback, um, positive feedback loop, which further exacerbates the problem. When the permafrost layer is lost, the lake often disappears, right? The water, there's nothing holding it there. It just disappears into the ground, which means that there's habitat loss um, that's happening. Um, there are these kind of hummocks that occur in the Arctic, these pulsa mires um, that collect bits of water. These hummocks are basically full of, of permafrost. These are dramatically being lost. This is one of the habitats of, of Somatochlora salbergi. So with forest fires taking place in the Arctic, with loss of habitat, with loss of pulsa mires, with increasing encroachment of, of salt water, basically what we're seeing is that Somatochlora salbergi um, is getting threats from multiple angles. Um, already when we've gone to do sampling, what we find um, is that we've done sampling in, in the Yukon, we've done sampling in, in Sweden, Finland, and Norway, um, and we're seeing that there's turnover. The ranges where we normally would find this dragonfly, we don't find it, and instead we find taxa that would normally be found further south. Um, that have replaced it um, in many parts of their habitat. Some good news is though, that we actually found some samples of, this is what the nymph or the juvenile stage looks like, the one that lives in fresh water. We actually found um, some of these further south in Finland than we expected. And they were actually like, um, was described earlier about finding things in cities. These were actually in a city. We happened to pull over on the side of the road for kind of like a bio break um, and decided to do some sampling um, at a kind of lentic habitat that was there. And lo and behold, somatochlora is there. Um, so there's still a lot more work that we need to do on this taxon, but our, our, we're finding kind of some extreme responses to climate change in the Arctic. And we, the few species that have been studied in other parts of the globe, we're finding similar, um, kind of a similar story. So I think one of the biggest threats for dragonflies really is that we don't have a lot of baseline data. We don't really know how big any population is. We don't really know how far individuals traveled. The Pantala that Sibylla talked about before, we know how far that travels because people have studied that one taxon. Um, but for the majority of the 6,500 species, we don't necessarily know their full extent of their geographic range. We don't necessarily know how big a population is, how many populations there are. We don't really know um, even some female preferences for lentic and lotic habitat, for female preferences for where she likes to lay her eggs, how her preferences for riparian cover or forest cover. Without knowing that data, it's very hard to make predictions. Um, and it's also very hard to set conservation strategies. So um, kind of like a, a to-do list of what we all should be doing is going out to nature and observing dragonflies. I thought when I started studying dragonflies, maybe everything was known about them because they are so charismatic. They're so ubiquitous at water. They're so colorful. I assumed nothing that I could contribute would actually be new, but it's so far from that. Actually, any observation that you make, if you decide to go for a walk tomorrow and you stop for 15 minutes and observe what a dragonfly is doing, that probably actually is a useful data point that a citizen science or a, or a researcher could use because we actually need everybody to have their eyes open really um, and kind of documenting which dragonflies are found where so that this base data is the foundation that we can build conservation strategies on. Yeah, I think this is, is wonderful, especially when we think about, you know, that kind of every person could become um, a spokesperson for a sp specific species. And, and as we know, I mean, not uh, like we, we are all entangled in this world and, and it is not that everything is connected to everything, but everything is connected to something. And I want to paraphrase this to maybe not everyone needs to observe everything, but everyone can observe something. And I think, you know, like um, distribute also this responsibility um, of noticing and, and caring for I mean, observing as, as a form of care um, yet yeah, to, to, to all of us, I think would be super helpful in this crisis. I think it can empower people really, um, you know, to have a role in this. I, I have a Nana who is 95 and she likes to do things in her garden. And often she'll say, oh, I saw this dragonfly. Oh, it doesn't matter though. You probably already don't need it. And that's the really common pervasive idea in people's head is that 
their information, their contribution isn't needed. But we need to empower people to know that these their contribution actually is probably going to help us make the changes that we need to protect, to even first document the species for conservation purposes, but then to protect them. We need to definitely give people the, the confidence that they too, it, it doesn't, you need a pencil and a paper. Uh, in some cases, there's apps like Sibyl mentioned, but it's really you just need a pencil and a paper uh, to write down what you see. Maybe if may I jump in there briefly? Just um, I, I mean, you, you talk about what you see. Um, we actually um, initiated a project during the lockdown, the first lockdown in 2020, um, which was about experiencing biodiversity not through the eyes but through the ears. Um, and it was really uh, after noticing this effect that um, um, with less airplanes in the sky and less uh, uh, fewer cars on the roads, that uh, people could actually hear. Uh, natural sounds, soundscapes, uh, you know, the biophony much more clearly than they could before. And also most people were stuck in their homes and not going on commutes so that they could actually pay attention to the local soundscape. So, so um, uh, we started this project called Dawn Chorus to get people um, like your Nana <laughs> in her garden, to, uh, people to go out and actually make uh, recordings either from their balcony or their window or, or, or a garden or a park of the, the local dawn chorus of the birds. Uh, and uh, we found that thousands of people were excited to do this and, and they really found a, a value in sharing that uh, dawn chorus soundscape. It was inspired by an artist called Bernie Krauss who created this amazing work called the Great Animal Orchestra. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we found really interesting in that project uh, was um, that uh, it seemed that when people experience biodiversity through the ears, uh, it has a very powerful emotional connection for them. So, you know, if you notice that one species is, is no longer there that you used to hear, or if you hear some new new species, and if you just stop and listen to the, the, the natural world, it, it can be a very powerful thing, thing for people, even if traditionally the eye is the organ uh, with which uh, we explore nature. Uh, so um, I, I think the ears can also sometimes be interesting. Uh, as a as an instrument, um, but maybe can I ask a question uh, just to because I, I was very intrigued when Sibyl was uh, talking in her presentation about um, you know cyborg insects and uh, you you mentioned Sibyl the work of um, Martin Wikowski at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Animal Behavior here in Constance and. Um, you know, the, these projects tracking animal movements from space and putting little backpacks on animals and so on. And uh, this is a very interesting new area. Some people call it the, you know, the internet of animals is, is a phrase that is used. And the idea that uh, animals, um, particularly birds, but also insects can be like extended sensoria for humans and can be, uh, we can in a way piggyback on their amazing sensory capabilities and also their, their mobility. Um, and uh, you also mentioned that somewhat dark project, uh, uh, the Draper uh, project, uh, Dragonfly, which um, is goes a little bit beyond using in insects to sense the world and actually allows you to control the insect like a biological drone and control its flight, um, uh, which raises all sorts of ethical questions. And you know, is this something that we should should be doing? And you know, how soon before uh, there is military use of this, etc. Um, you know, what, what do people think about this idea of, you know, on the one hand, this idea of interspecies cooperation facilitated through technology, which could be a very exciting promise, uh, but on the other hand, the risk of a, a, a new form of uh, exploitation of the non-human. I'd be really interested in, in your thoughts on that, but uh, both, both Sibyl and Jessica, um, from your different perspectives. Would you like to start, Jessica? Maybe, or should you, I? Uh, yeah. uh, oh, please go ahead, Sibyl. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I mean, it's it's stunning, you know. I mean, this is technology, and 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 it it has so much promises of what we can do with that and what it allows us to see. Um, but yeah, I think I mean, like there is this 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 uh, thin line that uh, has to be not crossed about like how, how not to harm other species and. Um, yeah, what is what is the benefit for us and for the, for the community of of all species um, wh when we use them or misuse them? And I mean, like, um, like, yeah, like when we think about insects, for example, as pollinators, we are also 
um, there's also the, 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 the form of um, transporting um, bees with, with LKVs uh, thousands of kilometers uh, uh, each year through America just to pollinate the, the almond trees. Um, and this is a big business and this is using them. And, you know, like there's, there's this, this op option to do something. And then there's the thin line of, of yeah. when it gets to some overconsumption or misuse and, um, yeah, I mean, like in, in this uh, darker example, um, the dragonfly, um, there's, yeah, there's this, um, this sensor is manipulating the, the insect, the insect does not have its own will any longer. And it's like, it's becoming a machine. And, and it's an interesting discourse, because, um, yeah, we, all our media are also in, inspired by, by this swarm behavior and swarm intelligence. And, um, you see, Parika was writing very nicely about that in insect media also, but and and but also to acknowledge insects themselves as media, you know. And I think it's it's maybe more terrestrial uh, to use the term of Bruno Latour to to regard insects as sensors in themselves rather than um, attaching sensors to them um, in order to learn more. And I think yeah. And in, in, in that moment, it gets harmful. Um, I, I'm personally not, not sure uh, if we should cross this line. If we become more human to this potential, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess I would feel a bit uneasy in part because I, I, I just enjoy dragonflies being able to live their lives and do what they need to do. Um, and also I do feel particularly cautious because many of these technologies when they're found that are that have the potential of having ethical issues um, often the vic the people who are harmed the most are people of color um, people from the global south and so if this was going to be a, a technology that would further exacerbate inequality um, the lack of equity uh, then that that it just seems like a bitter twist to try to use dragonflies for that um, as an aside, I found it, I actually loved looking at those photos to build because um, so that the the photos that you had of the the radio transmitter that was glued, that was actually my PhD advisor's fingers holding that annex. Um, they used eyelash glue, a combination of eyelash glue and crazy glue to glue it to them. Um, and that project was very challenging because it the wing loading, which is the size of the wings, the area of the wing relative to the mass of the body, which is kind of over evolutionary time has been perfected um, so that they could fly uh, is thrown off by carrying the weight of those transmitters. So many of the, my colleagues who have used that technology find that they find the, the bulk of their transmitters in the bellies of frogs because the dragonflies are kind of constantly uh, poorer flyers than they would otherwise be and they get eaten. So in the, in the example that you showed um, with actual solar panels, that was from a particular family, Libellulidae, which tend to be slightly smaller um, and they can carry even less weight. So I'm actually kind of amazed um, to, to imagine how well a dragonfly with those technologies on it would be able to fly um, because so far we haven't been able to make things very commonly to be small enough that they could actually um, be able to fly well without being eaten by birds and frogs. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a kind of funny twist, um, it would be funny if humans put all of our energy into making these cyborg dragonflies. Frogs and birds are still, they're frogs, birds, fish, lizards, they're constantly eating dragonflies. And I bet you these cyborg dragonflies are going to be in the bellies of a lot of yeah. uh, vertebrates. <laughs> so they'll be selected that's out. Kind of what happens. <laughs> <laughs> the cyborgs will be selected out by uh, a vicious process of natural selection, you think? Yeah, maybe. I mean, and it's like what you said about the, what we choose to spend money on. Yeah. We could choose to set, spend money on sending billionaires to space. We could choose to spend money on making cyborg uh, dragonflies that end up in the bellies of frogs. Um, yeah. Or we could choose to spend money on, on equity issues to actually make science um, more equitable and make the people who are being most impacted by climate change not always be people from the global south and indigenous communities. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think what, if I just to jump in, I, I think it's important to distinguish between the kinds of projects that people like Martin Wachowski are, uh, which are doing, which are actually often 
working, for example, a stork project with local communities in Africa where there are, there are storks uh, on their migratory paths and actually involve a deep local connection in a very positive way. And then the, the rather kind of uh, sci-fi uh, vision of the, the dragon eye, which uh, does, seems to really have an, uh, be uh, underpinned by ideas around payload delivery and reconnaissance and uh, you know, hinting at uh, military usage, which is a completely different uh, kind of goal. And also, as Sibyl said, this is really some something where the goal is actually to control the flight of the dragonfly mm -hmm. and to remove its uh, uh, any any sense of free will. So, so I, I think the ethical issues around it are completely different. But uh, yeah, no, a it's, good it's, point. it's an interesting interesting emerging uh, uh, space, though. This uh, and the, and the yeah the you know the question of how we can have a, a, a a, a beneficial way to work together with the dragonflies and learn from their sensory cap capabilities. I think is interesting. Um, one more question, if I may throw throw at you. Um, I mean, it's really interesting that dragonflies. I mean, they like uh, evolved in the the Carboniferous, right? I mean, the, they they are creatures all you know that evolved um, around three hundred million years ago originally. So they're they're these very ancient creatures, um, and they evolved in this moment when. Uh, through the swamps on the Earth's surface, we were in the process of laying down all of this carbon, right? We were, we were, you know, there was huge amounts of uh, carbon being sequestered. The original fossil fuels were being created, and you know, maybe in some ways we can think about them from the kind of work that you're about doing as a sort of messenger uh, for a new Carboniferous. You know, that we need a new age when uh, we find actually ways uh, to to draw down uh, huge quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere as uh, happened uh, during the time of the dragonflies and leading them to be very adapted to uh, breathing large quantities of oxygen. Uh, do, you, do you think that we need a new Carboniferous? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the griffin flies, the proto-odonates that flew during the Carboniferous, Meganura, Meganurapsis, I mean, I would actually be kind of fascinated, but yet terrified if those were alive today, because although they were poor flyers, they did have beaks and they were uh, pretty good predators. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that we we sh definitely should look towards Odinates as they're really, it's our, the closest thing we have to time travel. Um, looking at insects is the closest thing that we have. Modern Odinata, modern dragonflies and damselflies, 250 million years. I mean, we want to know what's happened, what happened in the tri Triassic. We want to know the impact of birds. You can look to insects and actually kind of track the pressures at different, the rise and falls of of, of different evolutionary processes that, that took place over hundreds of millions of years. Maybe we'll never have time travel, but insects, you know, studying their behavior, studying their biology, studying their evolution, looking at what they did in the Carboniferous, that's kind of our only way to really time travel. But can I uh, just comment on that? Because I think it's it's really nice that you mentioned this, this time scale on that. Um, and you know like with the sciences we 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 are, have the ability to do these time travels back in times to to see what was 400 million years ago and also with with like these collections of data like maybe climate data but also biodiversity data we are also trying to yeah anticipate the future and um I mean, like that is kind of a construction of, of times that, that are maybe also not always helpful. And what I think is interesting when we look at insects that they have their own time spans and very different time spans than, than humans. So actually, um, as they are um, sentinels also for climate change, um, and I'm, I'm wearing my fly again. <laughs> I love your fly. It's a really <laughs> it's, great prop. It's just here today. It came for the talk. Um, yeah, I, I'm interested in, in this. You know, I became interested in what do we learn from another time scale that is not produced by, by technology and by our way of measuring time, but, but by acknowledging this diversity of times that um, exist in ecological systems and how they are connected with each other. When we look at, at um, for example, dragonflies as climate canaries, I mean, like they react so much faster to, to changes in temperature than we do. So, so it's like an early warning system. Um, yeah, so, so I want to hear your opinion about that, both of you. And like, how do we, how we, how do we look in the future if we acknowledge that it's, it's already there and, and in different places uh, differently than, than here in Germany, for example, uh, in the global south, we have the disaster since many decades already. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, I think, what can we learn about time from insects to be short? <laughs> 
Jessica, do you want to? Uh, well, I mean, I would definitely say that um, what it, you know, generation time being so much faster in some insects, although I would note for dragonflies, they can have five or six, seven years as juveniles before merging as adults. So they're not like fruit flies, but still the generation time is so fast that um, we, we really can look to them to, to see whether or not, how, for how long we've been, um, I guess, experiencing the impacts of climate change. And when we do this, when people have tried to do this for dragonflies and damselflies, I mean, like Sibyl mentioned, it, this has been going on for a long time, just because humans for political reasons may now be willing to acknowledge that this is happening. Um, it doesn't mean that it's just starting to happen now. And I think it's really important. We can take, we can um, really harness the information from the fact that we have these, these organisms that have much faster generation times than we do. Um, sometimes 200 generations in a human lifetime some for, if it's thinking of dragonflies, but much, much more if we're thinking about some of the insects that have very, very rapid generation times. So we really should look to their time scales um, as kind of like very fine focus on, you know, daily, monthly um, changes in weather, daily, monthly changes in kind of habitat in, in aridity and, and what have you. Um, I think that this is the key is really to, we, we are so, I, well, I guess this is the nature of being human. We're very mammals focused. We're very, very mammal focused. And mammals have very different time scales um, than insects. People have been, I mean, I can remember when I was growing up as a child, so much of what was talked about for conservation, world wildlife and what have you, was always mammals. And their time scales are so ridiculously long compared to dragonflies, compared to, you know, even head lice. I mean, pick any insect, really. I don't know why uh, we should not pick an, a terrible insect like a, like a louts. Um, that would be a perfectly good insect to study climate change because they actually do move um, in response to, to human movements as well and other animal movements. So we need to kind of use, take advantage of the speed with which um, they respond. Um, I think it's really, I think it's vital. Michael? Yeah, well, I don't know much to add to that great answer, but but the, I mean, I, I think the point that you made about um, dragonflies, uh, we, we think of the fly when we think of dragonflies, but really, you know, uh, objectively, uh, most of the life of that organism is underwater as a, as a larva. Uh, and uh, by far, and, and depending obviously on which type of dragonfly, but and this is, you know, quite a terrifying underwater predator that, uh, you know, you, talk, you talked about the frogs uh, grabbing the adult dragonflies out of the air with, you know, with their backpacks. Uh, but of course, the, the tadpoles are terrified or, you know, constantly being predated by the, the larvae. Uh, so it's an interesting kind of cycle uh, but but one where the the time below the surface is far greater usually than the time above and and uh, so we, we probably need to the normal perception of dragonflies uh, need, maybe should should change uh, um, but I, I think in terms of what you were saying Sibyl about the kind of climate indicators and the way insects can play a role as climate indicators it's 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 really interesting um, you know for example I mean here here in Germany uh, we had a huge kind of uh, moment of awareness around insect biodiversity when there was this um, research published based on citizen science actually uh, in the national parks in Germany where they realized that the insect biomass had dropped by or over 75 percent in in about 30 years so uh, a huge drop in insect biomass and that really was an alarm bell that that was a huge trigger uh, and uh, drove a lot of people even to the streets uh, uh, for biodiversity um, and uh, but the interesting thing is it's uh, insects aren't just disappearing. So, so here in, in Munich, in the Botanic Gardens, for example, there's a citizen science project about wild bees. Uh, oh, I see your fly is appearing again. Uh, and uh, the wild bees, uh, um, uh, funnily enough, the number of species is actually increasing due to climate change uh, because there are bees that are normally in warmer areas that are suddenly uh, finding that Munich is a good place to be. Uh, and uh, so, Climate change has has different effects on on, on species uh, movements and, and migrations, and doesn't always mean that uh, species will disappear. They might actually uh, come into an area. And uh, but but a greater attunement of, of the public to the behavior of the insects and involvement of people in these kinds of citizen science projects can can really be uh, very valuable in understanding uh, what's going on with with climate change and. Uh, 
and uh, of course, you know, we are no different. You know, we will um, in many places have to have to move and migrate in, in response to changing climate conditions uh, and to whether flooding or desertification and so on. Um, so I, I think this, uh, you know, the, this idea of, of tuning into dragonflies uh, as indicators of water quality on the one hand, which was discussed earlier, but also the you know their their patterns of movement and these amazing migratory dragonflies. The the uh, you talk in in your artwork. You have the the globe skimmer dragonfly, which uh, I was fascinated to learn about. I hadn't uh, learned about that before, but uh, it seems to be an incredible migratory creature. Um, but uh, I I think that you know also as we reimagine the museum. In the old days, museums were all about static uh, specimens and. Uh, to understand nature as something that's constantly in motion and, and con subject to constant change, I think is, you know, something that we really need to, to connect the public to right now and uh, uh, really empower people to go out and, and discover the nature on the doorstep. Michael, to connect the public was a very good keyword because we have a Telegram group. There have not been so many questions yet, probably one. Uh, question and a lot of remarks and uh, a lot of also inspiration and uh, enthusiasm uh, for uh, for the topic and for dragonflies and for insects. Um, uh, I, th I would uh, like to encourage the public to um, put their questions now because we don't have so much time left. And uh, there was just uh, also one question regarding specific projects where uh, insects uh, are used or like um, yeah, used for researching uh, or forecasting uh, and evaluation of the environment. If you know any uh, research projects, uh, would be great if you could share your knowledge. Well, we, I mean, we, we routinely kind of look at and measure biodiversity um, as, and we measure biodiversity in, in different areas. Um, and we measure it kind of a, along a geographical scale and then also along a time scale. Um, and we can look at differences in biodiversity um, and that can tell us something about the environment. Um, figuring out which members are part of a community, which species are, make up a community, um, if that composition of species changes, if the species that are in a community are more generalists or more specialists. Um, all of those, we, we have many of those projects kind of underway globally um, with colleagues uh, kind of around the globe with often dragonflies are the top predator, um, but dragonflies don't have to be there for us to be wanting to do it. But dragonflies are often the top predator in these communities, which is why we, we have been involved. Um, so those are just some of the ones that I have thinking off the top of my head. The Black Odinatology Working Group has been measuring biodiversity of odinates um, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in parts of West Africa, where they often, again, are the top predators in these in river, um, in flowing and, and still water systems um, and understanding um, their role really kind of gives insight into the overall community and the environment in an area. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Jessica, for uh, re uh, replying. Probably uh, Sibyl or Michael, John, would you like to? I don't know much to add to that. I I I, I would. Um recommend also looking at the, the work of Martin Wikowski, who was mentioned a couple of times, and the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. Um, and there, you know, there, there's, it's not all about insects, uh, uh, but, it, but there's a huge amount of work on that uh, going on there uh, about uh, animals and uh, animal tracking and uh, weather and uh, air currents and so on, uh, monitoring of uh, environmental uh, indicators. So, that I, I would just suggest to have a look at what they're doing. Maybe, I don't know if Sibyl wants to add anything. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, both, both of what you said is, uh, is completely right. And I think every, I mean, like you don't need to go far. I mean, like every, um, yeah, every museum or institution close by um, should have some of these projects. So you could just connect to your local researchers and, and try to, to figure out what you can do, what you can observe. Um, I will, of course, uh, continue my research on these intersections um, with the with the network of researchers I've, I've developed. So we we'll stay tuned to my works, maybe also, and uh, my research. And yeah, I think what was also interesting, I mean, like really, I think the local connectivity with, with institutions is, is very important and to build local communities also um, and to really figure out what, what is what is to observe and, and relevant for for your livelihood um, for for your um, environment also um, 
Yeah, but also, uh, Jessica, you just mentioned the, the plague entomologist, entomologist sorry. Um, and, and just to have a, a last question um, addressing this, because um, we, we are talking about listening to other voices and other sensors, etc. cetera. And um, you, you've been just publishing um, a super interesting article on colonialism and entomology. And I've been addressing that um, the specimen of the natural history museums have, um, yeah, also a colonial, like come from a colonial past um, from this, um, yeah, collections uh, during imperial times. And you address this, uh, this history in this article. Um, and, and I wonder, because, I mean, like, research infrastructures should not be shaped by, by bias and, and racism and colonial past. Um, and, and, and still we, we have ongoing power structures, um, distribution of resources that you mentioned earlier. So I wonder if you could just shortly um, talk about your engagement um, for, for uh, initiating communities and um, yeah, for collectives um, for more diversity and equity in sciences. Um, uh, thank you, Sibyl. Yeah, I think that talking about colonialism, um, which existed in the, in there's kind of the historical uh, strings that tie to it, we still still exist, but of course there's also neocolonialism happening right now in the way that many of us do our expeditions. Uh, we've really tried to, to not do this in my lab. And I think many researchers, many of my peers have really tried to move away from parachute science. But for a long time, neocolonialism existed by those of us who had won a sort of lottery by being born in a rich country in the global North, were able to afford to go to places, grab as many specimens as we could, and then go back to our institutions to describe them, um, leaving our colleagues in the global north uh, who didn't necessarily have the same access to capacity building um, to, to, um, to, to kind of be left behind. Um, I think the, an early part of the conversation was that many people, that the conversation was being framed by people from the global north trying to think of what needed to be done to fix this problem. So then the debate was like, oh, it's just a debate about whether or not we should repatriate specimens. But if the museum's not in good quality in, in Nigeria or Guyana, we're not going to send the specimens back. It turns out if you actually listen to people who are from the global south, they might say to you, as my colleagues and I, uh, who wrote this article argued, that's not necessarily the thing that people are asking for. What we're asking for is to have shifts in our rubrics of what success is, shifts in access to opportunities, um, shifts, right now we have a lot of new technologies for morphological analysis, computed tomography, x-ray scanning, some of the many images that you showed in, in your presentation, Sibyl, show how, uh, you know, what the amazing technology is, genetics and genomics is undergoing a, a renaissance, a revolution. Um, all of that knowledge and capacity, money, and what goes with it is power, is concentrated in the global north. Um, further disadvantaging our colleagues in the global south. So we need to think, um, I guess about, I think we need to think more clearly about the way that we do our science, the way that we do expeditions, the way that we maintain true collaborations that are actual collaborations where our colleagues are able to also do skill building. They're also able to share their indigenous knowledge and have their knowledge be valued. Um, and we can, as I think we need to think about ways that we change our behavior um, rather than just thinking about ways that we want to try and um, encourage people in the global south to change their behavior. A lot of the behavioral change that's going to have to take place has to take place with us who are in the global north, who are, who are at these big institutions. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things that's a bitter pill for some people to swallow, I don't know if that's an English expression that doesn't translate, but uh, one of the things that people don't want to have to do is they don't want to have to give up all of their privileges. But of course, if we want to have equity, then that means you sometimes have to give up some of the things that you have to allow others to be able to fully and equally participate. And I think that's a challenge um, in entomology. It's a challenge in museum science. It's a challenge in science more broadly uh, for us to be able to accept that if we want to have more people participate, more people who are making decisions at the table, some of us have to give up our seats so that others can sit down. Um, not everybody wants to do that yet, but but it's a conversation we need to keep having. 
Yeah, it's uh, also a very important issue. I think we could also make a special, <laughs> probably, issue of the terrestrial university about uh, equity and, uh, yeah, in, in diversity in research, science, and also in culture, because uh, culture, I think, is uh, still also a field that uh, needs uh, also to draw a lot of attention to this kind of uh, problematics. Um, we have uh, now half past uh, eight, uh, and uh, I think our time, unfortunately, unfortunately, is uh, going to an end. Probably, we can build in the last uh, question if um, you would like to to exchange a bit more. There are still no questions from the public. I think they are all very <laughs> much, uh, yeah, inspired and uh, uh, by by the complexity and also by the richness of the topic. And uh, if you have a uh, uh, something uh, to, to tell us uh, at the end of the issue, it would be great if you could uh, share your just very late uh, last so thoughts on, uh, on the topic. Okay, then probably if uh, um, there is uh, there are no questions, I would still very much like to ask the very last question to Michael. And because we haven't uh, spoken about this yet, and uh, we have here an artist also and a scientist, and uh, I would just very much like to briefly know uh, how you think of uh, art also in uh, the Natural um, uh, History Museum. How uh, would you, uh, what is your vision for Biotopia to combine diverse, also diverse uh, knowledge branches in um, and integrate them in the museum? Very briefly, if you, uh, yeah, if you, if you could. <laughs> do, you, do you have another hour and a half? <laughs> That's a, so it's hard to answer that question briefly, but, but um, I, I think um, from Sibyl's work and from the dialogue that, we, that we've, we've heard with, with Jessica, and uh, we, we can see that uh, having artists engaged with these kinds of topics raises all sorts of interesting questions and also opens sometimes quite uh, erudite science up to different audiences who, who may not already be uh, uh, hugely engaged with science. And I think that's the same uh, when one has musicians like Bernie Krauss engaging with, uh, with uh, uh, the natural world. And um, uh, one, one, one can, uh, uh, rather than dumbing down the science, one can just open up the science in, in new ways and uh, provide, uh, also help to ask new questions about the science and, and uh, whether they are questions about the uh, the ethical issues around the science, uh, which we've j just been talking about and, and hearing about, uh, or whether they are questions that are um, uh, really um, uh, diving into the practices and processes of knowledge creation in science. And, and I think uh, um, you know, there's a long tradition of, of artists engaging with science, uh, you know, going back uh, over 2000 years. Uh, and um, I, I, I find that having not, not only artists, but also designers, architects, uh, uh, engineers, um, and uh, policy makers uh, engaging with science is a rich and fertile territory. And I think that's something that is really close to the heart of the ZKM. So that's one of the reasons I applaud uh, the, this whole project of, the, of critical zones and uh, uh, also this, um, uh, the terrestrial university that, that you're running, because I think you're, uh, you're already well aware of, of the, the fruitful nature of uh, the provocations and conversations sparked off by bringing artists to engage with science and, and also getting scientists, scientists involved in conversations with artists. I think it, it flows both ways. So, I mean, this is something that we are, uh, is part of the vision for Biotopia. We want to be a, a transdisciplinary place uh, to explore uh, these big questions about humans' relationships with other species. Uh, and uh, we will also have a bio art and design studio within Biotopia and residency programs, uh, residencies for artists, but also for scientists and uh, even for chefs, because we have a big uh, focus around food and eating. Uh, and um, I, I think that, uh, you know, artist scientist collaborations don't always work, but they often throw up really interesting questions. And, and sometimes they, you know, they may not lead to a new uh, piece of concrete scientific research, but they can sometimes have also the scientists asking new questions about the work that they do. They do. So I, I think they're um, something that uh, should be supported. And I think it's great to see uh, organizations like ZKM, but also as we heard from Sibyl, like the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin and uh, other uh, organizations. I, I don't know how much art uh, 
residencies, how much that goes on in New York, maybe uh, Jessica can tell us about that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, certainly this, this is fertile territory. And uh, uh, I think uh, something that uh, where, where we, we, we really um, have a chance to, you know, there's this idea of going from STEM to STEAM and including art along with the, with the sciences. Um, but uh, art shouldn't just be something to express science or to, to communicate science, but should be uh, an equal uh, partner. So we shouldn't be like the dragonfly with the backpack, I think. Uh, uh, you know, the artist sh should be more like a, an equal collaborator with the scientist. But uh, Jessica, do you, do you have uh, art science um, programs uh, going on in New York in the American Museum of Natural History? We do. There's quite a lot of steam that goes on for kind of what they call K to 12. So elementary school through high school uh, programs that they have at the museum um, and, and, and what they call steam, you know, the STEM plus A for art. Uh, steam programs are also really, you know, common uh, for the undergraduate program that we have have as well. And I'm I'm the incoming president for the Entomological Society of America. Um, mm. And we have a meeting that's coming up in 2022 in Vancouver. And actually the theme is, uh, I don't know if I'm giving it away by saying this on live on this broadcast, but our theme is actually insects as an inspiration, you know, using them in art and cooking and music and, and, mm. and what have you. I think that's kind of the wave of the future is really to, to incorporate insects into all aspects of the human kind of condition, our human social condition. It sounds like you'll have a nice conference dinner at that event. Yeah, I think so. Nice you have to join us. Bon appetit. Bug appetit. That's what Josephine <laughs> always says. My colleague always says, bug appetit <laughs> from Brooklyn Bugs. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for answering this uh, difficult and uh, yeah, a very uh, large uh, question. That's uh, that was uh, super that you uh, still could share also the thoughts about uh, the um, uh, collaboration of art and science. Um, I'm afraid we have to um, come to an end here, and uh, I would like to uh, yeah to to probably um, sum up in uh, one. Uh, sentence uh, what uh, we learned today uh, that insects might be uh, bioindicators dot angels uh, that was also stunning pests uh, but also of course and first of all cohabitants and I think arts of noticing it's really uh, important also for survival and uh, referring here not only to Annette Singh but also to Charles Darwin he also <laughs> uh, emphasized that uh, attention is very uh, important for uh, the survival uh, survival species and uh, we can get a lot of inspiration from the embodied environmental knowledge from the sensorium of uh, insects and uh, their senses for alternative ways of perceiving. And uh, also uh, we can get inspiration for being in dialogue with the world and for world making. So uh, I would like to thank uh, a lot our public for the attention for this quite long session. Uh, of course, also to thank our uh, colleagues from the video studio for mastering the live stream. Uh, Adamantia, Adamantia Gulantris, uh, sorry for uh, uh, chat, um, uh, care, care, for taking care about uh, the chat, and of course for uh, uh, to Beden uh, Dalmetschan for uh, interpreting uh, this probably sometimes difficult uh, to interpret uh, conversation, and of course uh, to thank you, uh, our guests, uh, for this very rich and fruitful discussion and uh, hope very much that uh, we will also come back at some point to all these interesting topics that have that could only be open in this uh, conversation and uh, we need a deeper uh, discussion and deeper exchange I think on all uh, of these topics thank you so much thank you thank you Daria for hosting everything and thanks everyone for the conversation it was a pleasure Thank you so much for the chance to participate and thank you Sibylla for this excellent insight into your artwork and nice to meet Daria and Michael, thank you. Thank you from my side as well and I'm really looking forward to yeah continue these discussions with you guys and uh, yeah I mean like uh, as, as Daria said this is maybe the open of something you know the the, the start of, of thinking of, of insects more, more explicitly and um, with more attention and care and yeah I mean like I would just invite all of you uh, the audience and, and us uh, to participate this global swarming to, to a more terrestrial future and present.